It was in this very courtroom in 1857 that I stood in this dock, accused of murder. Paul the Diet, Her Majesty's Advocate against Madeline Smith. Madeline Smith, now or lately in the prison of Glasgow, you are indicted and accused at the instance of the Lord Advocate that you wickedly and feloniously administered arsenic to Monsieur Longelier, or otherwise known as Pierre Emile Longelier, now deceased, on the 19th and 20th February 1857. That on 22nd or 23rd February, you did administer poison to the said Monsieur Emile Longelier, and that on 22nd or 23rd March, you did administer arsenic poisoning to the said Monsieur Emile Longelier and did murder him. The administering of poison with intent to murder and murder are crimes of a heinous nature and are severely punishable. How do you plead? Not guilty. For nine days, many starting at ten in the morning and continuing until after six at night, I sat here while evidence was led against me. My most intimate letters to my dear Emile being read out in open court to prove that yes, I had loved him, then that our love had turned cold. These letters I had tried to have returned to me by Emile prior to his death. I later became betrothed to Mr. Minnich, and because of this, the Crown felt I had a motive to murder Monsieur Emile Langelier by poisoning him with arsenic. Arsenic, I admit purchasing, for cosmetic purposes. My dear Emile was a clerk in a warehouse, whereas Mr. Minnich was wealthy and held a prominent position in the community. Crown were of the view that if it became known that a lady in my position had become involved in a passionate and licentious relationship with a commoner such as Emile Angelier, it would cause my engagement to Mr. Minnich to cease. To defend me from these charges, I employed at considerable cost, 100 guineas per day, plus a pressure, the services of the, the learned dean of faculty. Mr. John Ingalls, who later became Lord Glencourse, and two junior advocates, Mr. George Young and Mr. Alexander Manfrey. I relied on these learned and good gentlemen to convince the jury that the Crown had erred in saying that I had a motive for murder. The Lord Justice Clark and Lords Ivory and Handyside presided over the trial. I faced the most eminent prosecutors of the day. The Lord Advocate, Mr. James Mancroof, supported by the Solicitor General, an Advocate Deputy, and the Crown Agent. The public benches are full with all classes being represented. It could be that the whole of the Faculty of Advocates is in attendance. A goodly array of registered signet in their gowns, and upwards of a score of reporters. In the western side, the mustachioed scions of the aristocracy sit. Ministers of the Gospel are also present, as well as civil dignitaries in abundance. Such was the public interest in this trial that admission was by ticket only. Members of the bench also found great interest, with Lords Cowan and Dartmillan having finished their duties, joining the bench, as did Lords Murray, Wood, Dees, and others. For nine days, we heard evidence as to how Monsieur Langelier had appeared to have been poisoned 
on three separate occasions. How he and I had developed a relationship, how our letters revealed that our relationship was clandestine and passionate, and how I had sought their return after I became betrothed to Mr. Minnow. Gentlemen of the jury, after investigation of which its length has proved unexampled in the criminal annals of this country, I have now to discharge perhaps the most public duty that ever fell to my lot. It is now my duty to draw these details together and to present to you in connected shape the links of that chain of evidence which we have been engaged for the last week in constructing. If you give me your attention, you will arrive at the conclusion that there does not remain the possibility of escape for the unhappy prisoner from the net that she has woven for herself. Gentlemen, the indictment charges three separate crimes, two separate acts of administering poison with an intent to kill and the successful administering of poison with intent to kill. That is murder. Our case is that the administration with intent to poison was truly part of a design to kill. No language of mine, no language of my eloquent and learned friend, can convey to the mind one-tenth of the impression which the bare recital of the details of this case has already created throughout the whole country. I shall only say that these matters weigh on my mind, as I am sure they do on yours. While a prisoner in the position of this unfortunate lady is justly entitled to say such a crime shall not be lightly presumed or proved against her, if the charges of the indictment be true, if the tale I have told be a true one, you are trying a cause of as cool, premeditated, deliberate homicide as ever justly brought its perpetrator within the compass and penalty of law. Gentlemen of the jury, the charge against the prisoner is murder, and the punishment of murder is death. And that simple statement is sufficient to suggest to us the awful solemnity of the occasion which brings you and me face to face. But gentlemen, there are peculiarities in the present case of so singular a kind. There is such an air of romance and mystery investing it from beginning to end. There is something so touching and exciting in the age and the sex and the social position of the accused. You are invited and encouraged by the prosecutor to snap the thread of that young life and to consign to an ignominious death on the scaffold, one who, within a few short months, was known only as a gentle and confiding and affectionate girl, the ornament and pride of her happy home. Gentlemen, the tone in which my learned friend, the Lord Advocate, addressed you earlier could not fail to strike you as most remarkable. I am going to ask you for that which I will not condescend to beg, but which I will loudly and importunately demand. That which every prisoner is entitled, whether she is the lowest and vilest of her sex, or the maiden whose purity is as the unsunned snow. I ask you for justice, and if you will kindly lend me your attention for the requisite period, and if heaven grant me patience and strength for the task, I shall tear to tatters that web of sophistry in which the prosecutor has striven to involve this poor girl and her sad, strange story. The jury retired at 1 p.m. on the 9th of July, 1857, and returned only 22 minutes later. How do you find charge 1, administering of arsenic to the deceased? Not guilty. How do you find charge 2, administering of arsenic to the deceased? In respect of charge 2, not proven. How do you find charge 3? administering of arsenic to the deceased, whereby he was murdered. In respect of charge three, not proven. Instantly upon the announcement of these words, a vehement burst of cheering came from the audience, especially the public galleries, which was again and again renewed in increasing loudness, in spite of the efforts of the judges and the officers of court. Many of those closest to me uttered expressions of sympathy which affected me more deeply than that of any incident in the past nine days' trial. I was dismissed from the dock 
and a lady disguised as me was sent out to a waiting cab to pull the immense crowd outside. I left later by a side door. Shortly after the trial, I moved to London and became known as Lena Smith. I married a socialist called George Wardle and we had two children. He left me in 1889 and I moved to America where I married again and became Lena Sheehy. I died in New York on the 12th of April, 1928, aged 93. Émile Angelier was buried in the family plot of his kindly employer, Mr. Stevenson, in the grounds of Ramshorn Kirk in Glasgow.